Right. So the first gig you went to? Very first gig I went to was to see Mud. Mud famous for Tiger Feet and Lonely This Christmas, etc. I was in the Mud fan club and had a badge that said Mud on the Road, which had the Mud on the Road a road sign, you know, very clever, clever marketing. And my big sister took me to see that, uh, Glasgow Apollo 1974. And um, it was probably the most excited I'd ever felt about anything, including Christmas. I was so excited about it before it and afterwards. I was even more excited. It was just, it just felt like the most amazing thing. I would have been nine. And yeah, I thought I thought it was incredible, and I'm pretty sure that was part of the thing that made me go, "I'd like to do that. I'd like people reacting to something I'm doing, like everybody in the audience was reacting to that." I mean, the first band I saw was obviously the support band. But you never want to make that because people go, "Yeah, the first band I saw was," but and you, well, oh, that's impressive. But it's always a support band, and they were called Bilbo Baggins, and I have to say they were fine. But I wasn't that excited. And then Mud came on and it was just like, I mean, it was amazing. I loved it. Brilliant. Thank you. That's a great answer. I'll, I'll tell you when we finish my first gig because there's a story behind that as well. Right. Mm -hmm. um, the last gig that you went to? The last gig I went to was in um, the Flying Duck in Glasgow. And it was a band called Audiobooks for a duo. Uh, a, one guy one girl and I just think we're incredible you know again it's, it's bizarre I was so excited about it and I actually had a ticket for an earlier show but because of lockdown and um, kind of situations with not as much transport at the weekends I couldn't get to um, and I was really really disappointed and then suddenly they announced this gig which was during the kind of whole cop thing that was happening in Glasgow and I went along to it and I just felt like um, it's strange when you get a giggle of that. It makes you feel like you're that teenage version of yourself again. And I really felt like that. And, and my old friend, John Robb from the Membranes, he was there because he was covering various stuff and he hadn't seen him or heard from that point. And I was like, John, we're amazing. We're so exciting and we're just not like other people. And he totally loved it as well. So that was really exciting to be able to share it because I, I really felt I was going to the gig by myself. But um, I'm one of those people, I get really excited by things, but the thing I love most is when I can share those things I'm excited about with another person, particularly if they get it. Yeah, and John loved them and I loved them. And, you know, I was so excited and I got to speak to them afterwards and I felt my heart beating fast because I was excited to meet them. And the guy, David Wrench, I think, it's, uh, the guy from the band, who's, I think he's a bit younger than me, but he seemed, he, he knew who I was and he seemed kind of surprised at just how nervous and excited I seemed talking to him after the show. I was kind of, oh, it was so great. Oh, I loved it so much. <laughs> and I think he was going, a minute, you're somebody that's done lots of gigs. Why are you? But I did. I think they're amazing. Audio books. Brilliant. Thank you. Gig that most surprised you, good or bad? This is one I didn't have an answer for because I just, I mean, lots of gigs surprise me. I love when gigs sort of surprise me. But um, I can think of an, oh, actually, I can think of an answer now. The gig that most surprised me was probably Psychic TV. Um, and it was at Rooftops in Glasgow, which I don't think operates now as a venue. And I really, it's funny, I really liked Frog and Gristle, which were the band, I guess it kind of morphed, or half of it morphed into Psychic TV. The thing I really liked about Psychic TV was there was a guy from uh, Scotland called Alex Ferguson, not the, the football manager, um, who wrote really great pop melodies and he'd been in the punk band ATV and I was a big fan of his. And Psychic TV had some really, really great pop songs, but we didn't do any of them whatsoever. We just done the kind of more experimental, loose, kind of um, chant-like stuff and noise sort of stuff. And I was, so I was sort of disappointed by it 
And there was also quite a lot of um, like video footage of people getting um, their genitals pierced, getting projected on a screen behind them. And I mean, I knew they were in here, but I didn't necessarily think I was going to a screening of stuff about that. And then after the gig, I got beaten up. Um, just like kind of walking away from the gig. It wasn't anything to do with the gig. It was just a coincidence. Um, a bunch of guys kind of tripped me up as I passed by them and then you know, they were all kicking me. So it was surprising in lots of ways. Oh, absolutely. <laughs> it was a disappointing night out. Absolutely, yeah. Highs and lows. Recovered. Yeah, yeah. I'm glad I hope you have. Um, a great or a famous gig you had a ticket to but missed? Um, well, for me, it felt like a really uh, important thing. I don't think it was like a gig that would be seen as being a particularly big gig in this band's history, but it was um, the Ramones in 1985 at the Barrowlands. And all of my friends, I think we just um, I kind of really found such a wide group of friends who were all really into music. There had always been people like Sean Dixon and Norman Blake because we were from Bell Cell and then we got to know people like Francis McKee. But we'd now lots of kind of friends who were from all these different places and everybody was going and I got ill. And it was that kind of ill where you're barely able to just even walk to the bathroom or walk downstairs. The actual day I was at my most ill was the day of the Ramones playing the Barrowlands in 1985. And um, I remember being so incredibly disappointed that I couldn't be there because it felt like this was one of the first big night outs with this kind of group of friends um, and I wasn't there. And apparently it was amazing. <laughs> yeah, I bet it was. Yeah. I, I never saw them once. Um, about a bucket gig in the past that you wished you'd got to? Okay. Um, I think my bucket gig in the past um, is probably... Um, Carol King and it doesn't need to be actually any specific gig she's just somebody I really would have loved to see live and you know um, I mean she played uh, I can't remember it was like some big part down in London recently did an outdoor gig and the tickets were just you know I'm willing to pay a reasonably high price for a ticket if I've got that money but I didn't have that money and it wasn't fast enough if I had that money I wouldn't have been uh, fast enough to get a ticket. Um, yeah, I would love to see Carol King. When I went to New York um, a few years ago, um, I saw the show, Beautiful, which is the uh, Carol King, Jerry Goffin uh, story in Broadway. Um, yeah, in Broadway, and that was kind of amazing. And I was sort of kind of willing her, because I think she'll occasionally go along and see the show. I was willing her to be in the audience at night. It's kind of going, I bet if I really, really hope that she'll be there and makes a guest surprise appearance on stage, that'll probably happen. It didn't happen, but it was still really exciting to see it there. And um, yeah, she's, for me, she's the king of pop. She's the king of rock and roll, um, the, the one that counts. So I, I wish I had seen her in the past. Perfect. And she turned 80 this week, didn't she? I know. Yeah, look at that. Um, so... A bucket gig list, sorry, a bucket gig you're still waiting to go to? I've never seen Paul McCartney live. And it sort of surprises me. But again, the last couple of times that he was playing gigs that I could have got to, I just financially wasn't in a place where I was able to go. You know, it was one of the times I was still working at the BBC. I worked at the BBC for about a decade. And there was a female colleague who would always kind of, you know, say it. She was, I'm just obsessed by music. I'm obsessed by it. You know, and then you kind of find out her idea of being obsessed by an artist was having my idea of having a very vague passing interest yeah. in someone. And she told me she tickets to go and see Paul McCartney. And she's going, oh, I mean, I don't even know if I should go. I mean, I mean, I don't think I'm that, that interested. And I was going, well, give me the ticket. You know, are you crazy? Then she went, and the next day she was like, you know, Paul McCartney's actually written quite a lot of famous songs. I was, I couldn't believe it. I was like, quite a lot of the songs I heard at the concert. And I was saying to people, and did he write this one as well? And I'm like, how did she get to go? 
How could I not afford to go and she got to go? Um, but hopefully, I'm not better. Um, hopefully, one day I will get to see him. Yeah, well, he's still going, so fingers, I know. Crossed, fingers crossed. Oh, he's sprightly. Very much so. Um, band or artist you have saw the most? Well, the band that I've probably seen the most are Teenage Fan Club. And I don't know if that really counts because Norman was sort of like my best friend and at the start of Teenage Fan Club, I was nearly all the rehearsals and a lot of the recording sessions and stuff like that as well, you know. So um, I would think it's probably Teenage Fan Club, but second to Teenage Fan Club, because I just thought, you know, just in case that doesn't really count because um, I've got a personal in there, it's probably Jonathan Richmond. Um, massive fan of Jonathan Richmond. He's probably, in some ways, the guy who made me decide I wanted to do with my life what I ended up doing, making music. And um, I've seen him a great many times. Not recently, because he's not been over recently. Yeah. But anytime he was in town, I would be there. And he used to come, he used to come around a lot. Um, so yeah, Teenage Fan Club and then Jonathan Richmond. And I still think he's pretty much the greatest a solo live performer you could ever hope to see. I've taken friends to see him and, you know, mentioned to some like Norman, oh, I'm taking so-and-so to see Jonathan Richmond tonight. And he's went, oh, that's like going to school. That's like taking people, you know, to the great school you could ever go to if you want to be a live performer. Right. Perfect. Thank you. Couple to go. Uh, so, the best, best ever gig you've attended? Well, Jonathan Richmond was a real contender. I've actually decided to go for the band Tennis Coats um, from Japan, um, who are possibly my favourite group in the whole world. Um, and again, this kind of relates to Norman. I remember uh, Norman, Eugene, Kelly and myself were sitting um, in this beautiful church in Tokyo and we were going to be playing a show together and we opened an act for tennis coats and Eugene hadn't seen him before. And Norman and I were so excited because Eugene was going to get to see this act who to me, there's nobody like them. I just think they're a unique experience. My favourite gig by them is possibly um, in Mono Cafe in Glasgow in 2009. And I don't even know why that particular gig was so special to me. Possibly, I don't think it's this reason, they got me up to join, <laughs> join in, singing a part in Japanese. I don't speak Japanese, but I'd never sang before on a brand new song, so I couldn't prepare for it. And you'd think actually that could have almost spoiled it for me because I was incredibly nervous. But removing me from the occasion, all the other stuff that wasn't me was so, so amazing. Um, and um, yeah, I've been lucky enough to, you know, tour with them in Japan and stuff and um, see them a lot of times and actually even record with them. And I just think they are the most amazing live act you could possibly ever see. Thank you. And last question, one live album that we must own. Going back to Jonathan Richmond for this one. It's um, Modern Lovers Live on originally on Berserkly Records from 1977. Uh, it was recorded at the Brixton Academy in London and I actually got to speak to someone that was at that gig because I wasn't at that gig. I was too young and I wasn't going to be going to a gig in London in 1977. Uh, Glenn Matlock, ex of the Sex Pistols. And it's exactly what the record sounds like. He's sort of saying when they all went along, they were like, Oh, yes, yeah, is one of the real New York punks, you know. And he came on and sang all these songs about uh, little insects and little cooking hackens and little dinosaurs and ice cream men. And we were all a bit like, what? And he had a little pencil moustache and a, a kind of white blouse that was kind of tied at the belly button. And he, and he was, everything was acoustic and it was quiet. And he were all like going, what? And then there's a point in the gig and you can hear it in the record where they get it and they actually, and he's won them over and he was sort of saying, and you know, he wasn't singing songs about destroy and you know, being angry and stuff. And he was more punk than anybody. 
because he was just doing something that was so uniquely himself and not not going with the current momentum. And I just think it's such a joyful album. There's a track in it called The Morning of Our Lives. If ever I have a friend who's uh, feeling unsure about where we are in life, I always encourage them to listen to that because it's just such an amazing song of kind of hope and light. And that's sort of, again, one of the things that inspired me to want to make music because I wanted to make music that felt like that. So I think that's an amazing, whether it was a live album or not, I just think it's an amazing record. Incredibly human, incredibly warm and funny at bits. Perfect. Yeah, they're brilliant answers, Douglas. Thank you very much.